can tell me what is success? Who can tell me what success is? What does that word mean? What does the word success mean? Yes, ma'am. Sir, sorry, I didn't see you. Hold on. Success means what? Okay. Making it. Making it. Anybody else? What's success? You guys have to know what success is. Sir. It's something you accomplish. How many of you here have accomplished something? Raise your hand. So you guys should all know what success is. Success, however, has to be something we thrive for every single day. We must thrive for success. Now, a lot of you, I just talked to the football coach, and we had to talk about commitment. And we were talking about what does it mean to be committed. I was asking him about the team. He says we were great last year. We just need to become more committed. How many of you can truly say that you are committed to success? Raise your hand if you're committed to success. Now remember this, with success comes sacrifice. You guys know what habits are. Can anyone here tell me what are habits? Habits are what? Yes, sir. Habits, okay, smoking, what else? Habits, habits are what, yes? I'm sorry? Addicted to something. Habits are things you do every day. Did you guys brush your teeth this morning? Yep. You got to put your shoes on. Those are all habits. How many of you guys have had a dream before? Raise your hand. So you guys know what dreams are. Listen to this very quick scenario. I'll wait for you so you, you can't miss this. Listen to this. You have dreams and you have habits. If your habits don't match your dreams, you either need to change your habits or change your dreams. It's just that simple. Some of you want to be success, but you don't have successful habits. Let me say that again. Some of you want to be very successful without successful habits. I just now left the school in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, North Baton Rouge. You guys know Lil Boosie, it's where he's from. I left the high school and I talked to a small group of kids after I was done talking to a big group. And this group of kids told me how great they want to be. One of them said, I want to be a dentist. One of them said, I'm going to be a doctor. Somebody said, man, I'm going to be an engineer. Somebody else was like, I'm going to be a rapper. I was like, that's cool. Here's, here's the only problem. When I was talking to that small group, I was talking to them in the detention center. How are you going to be successful when you are not practicing successful habits? How many of you want to go to college? Raise your hand. There's going to be this roadblock in front of you. And you guys are going to have to kick that roadblock down. It's a three-letter roadblock. I call it, and it's a discriminatory roadblock too. But it doesn't discriminate against one race. In my opinion, it discriminates against all who aren't prepared. And it's called the ACT. How many of you have heard the terminology college readiness? Teachers, I'm sure you know that. College readiness. What's the highest score that you can score in the ACT? 32. A what? 36. If you score a 36 on the ACT, you are probably the smartest person in your school. In order to be college ready, you must have a 18 in English, which means you must need to score an 18 in the category of English, Reading, you must score 22. Science, you must score 23. And math, you must score 22. If you do not score those benchmark requirements, the state of Michigan will say you are not college ready. Raise your hand if you want to go to college. All of you need to know this so you will be college ready. In order to be college ready, you guys must give yourself an opportunity to create an opportunity for yourself. If you guys know seniors right now, who are not going to college, I bet you you will ask them where did they mess up? And they will say they probably messed up where? In the ninth grade. Because as ninth graders, here's what you think. We have time, I have time to fix it. But you know what, let me tell you when the time to fix it is. The time to fix it is now. You don't have to wait. Wait for what? There, there's not any time to wait because we don't know how much time we actually have. 
So the time can be today. If you want to be successful, you need to be successful today. If you want to be great, you need to be great today. Greatness is not something that God only gave to a few of us. All of us have greatness. If we recognize it, every single one of you in here have greatness. You just have to find out what your greatness is. How many of you are good at something? Raise your hand. What are you good at? Yes. You're good at singing. You want to come sing for me? Except, uh, so then are you really good at singing? I bet you you probably are. You're just probably shy. All of you need to be good at something. How many of you know people that are real good at text messaging, putting stuff on Instagram, doing stuff on Facebook, gossiping, getting in trouble? That's the only thing they're good at. Raise your hand if you know somebody. Don't point to them. I don't want to start a fight. Raise your hand if you know somebody. Okay, now put your hands down. Is that type of goodness, is that type of greatness something that's going to help them become college ready? Yes or no? no? I can't hear you. No. Absolutely not. Yet, everybody has the audacity to raise their hand when I say the word college. How many of you here know how to listen? Raise your hand. Okay. Now, hold on. Hearing and listening can be totally different. Because when your teachers are talking to you, and you have to ask your teacher, oh, excuse me, um, what did you say we're going to do? What do you mean? If you were listening, you would have got that instruction. If you were listening, you would have heard what your teacher said. Listening is the most important element in life that can dictate whether or not and how successful you are. Harriet Tubman was a slave. She freed 1,000 slaves. Harriet Tubman, is that a lot of people? If you free 1,000 people, would you be satisfied? Why didn't she free more? Hold on, somebody just said it. Say it again. Because they didn't listen. So hold on. So listen to this. All of us here, let's act as though, for a minute, we're slaves. I'm here in time. All right? I come to you guys and I tell you this. I say, look. I'm free. I say, look here, Gucci bag. <laughs> look, look here, Gucci bag. I'm free. You're free. If you listen to me, you will be free too. I have the key to free you from slavery. All you have to do is listen. Come on with me so you'll be free. Come on. So now Gucci bag is free. Now watch this. So I freed him. We try to tell all of you to follow us, to listen to us, and you don't choose to listen. See, some of you may think this is very simple. Some of you may be going to sleep. But the ones that are probably sleeping are the ones that will remain slaves. In order to free yourself from being an academic slave, you must listen, thank you. And you must know who to listen to. Where are my teachers at? Any teachers in here? Raise your hand. Teachers. How many of your students can you free academically if they listen? Right now, you're probably thinking, every single one of them. The only students that don't succeed are the ones that don't listen. And I know it sounds boring, but it's very simple. That's why I keep reiterating that point. Okay? Real good. Let's get back to dreams. Because in order to make anything happen, we must have dreams. Do we have anybody in here that, run, that runs cross country or runs track and field? Anybody? Okay, good. Do any of you run the mile? <laughs> you run the mile. What's your mile time? Hold on, I want to hear this. What, what's your fastest mile time, your PR? Uh, okay, real good. So listen to this. In 1954, there was a person by the name of Roger Bannister. Up until 1954, in the entire years that the earth was existing, nobody had ran a mile in under four minutes. The scientists, the coaches, everybody said it's impossible to do. So up until 1954, nobody had done it because nobody believed that they could actually do it. Nobody believed it. Finally, this guy named Roger Bannister, he said, man, look, I believe I can do it. And they said, well, how do you know that? He said, I've been dreaming about it. Every day I dream that I, that I, that I run a mile in less than four minutes. So he decided
decided to try it. Everybody was there. And he did it. He believed, he dreamed it, and he achieved it. Now, that's not the significant part. No one else had done it since up until 1954. Here's the part that's amazing. Since then, since he did it, over 275,000 people have ran a mile in under four minutes. Why were they able to do it? Why did 275,000 people do it after he did it? Yes. Because they believed. And that's what I need you guys to be able to do. You need to believe in your greatness. You need to find that dream of yours and you need to dream it. So then you can be it. How many of you here would like to be a professional athlete one day? Raise your hand. You can do it. How? If two professional athletes get married, just say Michael Jordan and Lisa Lester. No, let's say Scott and Oh, Michael Jordan and Scott and They got together, they had a baby. Do you think their kid is likely to make it to the NBA? Yeah. How many of you say yes? Both parents are professional athletes. How many of you say yes? Why do you think they have a better chance of making it? Yeah, they have more money. Yeah, they have more money. Why do you think they have a better chance? You can tell me why. Yeah. Shh, hold, hold, hold on a second. We'll wait. We'll wait for them. Okay, good. Say, say it again. Because they have money. Okay, maybe they can go to some different camps. Yes. Both their parents did. Both their parents did. I figured this out. Working with professional athletes, I figured it out. They, the only difference between them and you, they actually really believe that they're going to do it. Mama did it, daddy did it, so I'm going to do it. How many of you have been to the doctors lately? Have you, have you guys ever been to a doctor? Ask your doctor what does his parents do. What do you think your doctor's parents probably do? They were probably doctors too, right? <laughs> Hold on. They still had to go through the same academic format as you guys, but the only difference, hold on, they were able to believe. They believe in greatness. How many of you believe that you're great? Raise your hand. All right? Matter of fact, if you think you're great, I know this is going to get you, but stand up. Stand up. If you think you're great, stand up. Oh, you are great. Oh, I have a nice time. All right, now watch this. By standing up, Here's what I'm gonna ask you guys to do. Put your hands up. Put them up. Reach for the sky. Okay, now watch this. Shh. Hold on. We gotta do this silent. Now that your hands are in the sky, watch this. I'm gonna have you guys reach for greatness. So now that your hands are up, reach a little higher. There goes greatness right there. You just reached it. Alright, have a seat. Think about this. Put my hands here. Okay? This is good. I got my hands up. But watch how far I am from greatness. And tell me if I'm really far away from greatness. Was that from here to Florida? No. Was that a short distance? So how far are you guys away from greatness? You're very close to greatness. Okay? Last thing I want to address is creating an academic, no, no, no. I want to talk about wearing a uniform of success. What does it mean to wear a uniform of success? Do any of you have on a uniform of success today? Huh? You have on one, okay. You have on a uniform of success. What does it mean to wear a uniform of success? To create a uniform of success? Yes, sir. Believe that you can do it. When you put on a football uniform, you're part of a team, and you're part of a belief, and you're part of a system. You guys have to do the exact same thing academically. When you put on that uniform, it has to be considered a uniform of success. So when you put your clothes on, you need to know that I'm dressed in success. Okay? Good. I'm, I'm not going to bore you guys. I see some of you guys starting to um, slunch, but I do want to leave you with this. 
There are going to be a lot of people in your life that tell you you're not good enough. They're going to tell you you can't do it. After a while, you're going to start to believe it. They may even tell you you're ugly. They may say you're not smart. They may say you can't dribble the ball good enough. They may say you're not fast enough. Point period blank, you are not good enough. And that's not true. You are good enough. And I know you're good enough because I was good enough. And when I sat in those seats as a ninth grader, I was on my way to one place. We got to get that one. Jail. Jail. I wasn't on my way to success. As a ninth grader, let me share this and I'm going to get you out of here. As a ninth grader, I sat in those seats, thought I was hardcore, thought I had my boys, thought I had my crew. I was from West Willow, West Up, that's what we used to say. And anywhere we went, it was West Up. You say, you say hey, what's up? We say, West Up. And I thought that was being cool. My teachers told me where I was headed, and I didn't believe it until I got shot. You said, West Up. <laughs> Let me say that again. I thought I was headed in the right direction until I got shot. Yes, quiet now, but see, now it's getting real serious. Now, everything is turning serious once I say get shot. Now you stop looking around and you're like, whoa, how did you almost get shot? I, how did I get shot? I tell you, I didn't listen. As a ninth grader, my mom told me, don't go to the park. That's where the games were. That's where the drugs were. That's where the alcohol was. That's where they were shooting dice. That's where they were popping mollies. That's where they were smoking boozies. That's where they were blazing 51s. That's where they was doing double dutches. Not the double dutches that you jump on the road. That's where all that stuff was going down at. And my mom told me, don't go. But once again, because I didn't listen, I went. So I'm playing basketball, getting down, doing what I did. Three Cherokees, one, two, three, all red pulled up. They're on Tyler Road. We're at the court hooping. <laughs> Look up. All the guys come around from where they called the shoe. They all hung around at the shoe. They came around throwing up their game signs, throwing up their sets, flashing those burners. You know what a burner is. Flashing those burners. Three Cherokees pulled off. They thought they were celebrating, like, yeah, they know not to come to our hood. And maybe five minutes later, the basketball game is going on. <laughs> Look up at Tyler Road. One, two, three. Lined up in the road. I seen his doors come open. Once the doors came open, it was like the Red Sea was coming. All these dudes all read it up. You know where this is going. Look down at my left hand, I'm not kidding. 
my left hand was sticking up to here. I bent my finger. The blood went like a popping. I'm not kidding. It could have hit the ceiling. So I'm looking at this, and all I was thinking was, my mommy going to kill me. <laughs> now, I swear. So my friend Calvin Jones, if you were here last hour, you know Calvin Jones. I said it's a true story. His sister Betty put me in her son dance. She had a little red Sunday, so it was like, you need to go to the hospital. I drove to the hospital, I went in there, the doctor looked at my hand. He asked me what happened, looked at my wristband, oh Jesus dude, and I still lie. I said I was playing at the park, and I fell. And some glass got me, I did because I didn't want to get in trouble. They bandaged me up, I went home, until this day. I don't even think he knew this. Till this day, my mom passed away in 2005. She still never knew what happened. Mm. She never knew what happened. She asked me what I said. Oh, I just put a bandage on. I just hurt my hand. My point is, I didn't listen. And now, for me to be able to sit here and talk to students, talk to, I don't care if you're an athlete or not, for me to be able to talk to you and think about how I almost missed out on an opportunity in life because I didn't listen, man, that's kind of scary. What if that would have hit me in the back? My story would have been different. I could have never went to Wayne State University, graduated in four years, got a master's degree, had kids, got a nice house. I would have never been able to do that because I almost blew an opportunity. So what you guys need to realize is this. In order to be successful first, you need to give yourself that opportunity. You have to give yourself that opportunity. Those cell phones you guys play with all day that I see some of you playing with, that's not your opportunity. You, we become so addicted to other people's lives, we never know who we are. Trust me, I told my daughter, I said, look in the mirror. She said, what are you talking about, Dad? I said, look in the mirror. She looked. I said, who are you looking at? She was like, me? I said, who are you? She was like, Dominique. I say, you don't even know who you are, but you know everything about everybody else on social media because that's the life that we choose to live. That's not going to help you succeed. And I told her, give me that phone. Phone check, homie. <laughs> and I took her phone. And I said, don't ask me for this phone back until you find out who you are and write me a letter telling me who you are. And I'm going to tell you what. As I took her phone, watch this, as a senior, as I took her phone, as a senior, that saved her life. She was in the so much, y'all probably follow on Instagram and don't even know it's my daughter. She had so many followers and all this garbage, and it was doing nothing for her. Those two weeks that I took that phone, I think saved her life because she regained her focus. And she went into the basketball season and got down. Then she went to the classroom and got down. Then she took the ACT and scored a 26. She wasn't focused before. Before that, she had a 17 on her ACT. And I made a retake. Find out who you are and refocus your life, is what I told her. Refocus who you are. And in two weeks, she had to do it. So all I'm telling you guys is this. My program is called Creating the Change. And the change does not start tomorrow. The change starts today. You won't remember everything that I said today. I don't want you to. But find one thing I said today and try to use that to fuel who you can reinvent yourself to become. Because there are so many great people out here right now. Where are, where are the most talented people in the world? Say that again. Right here. Nope. Nope. <laughs> the most talented people in the world are in the brain. And let me tell you why. If you go to cemeteries, imagine how many great people died before they became great. So what are you going to do before you become great? Imagine how many people in a cemetery, if I died right now, so many ideas would die. It's still so much that I haven't done. I've done some, but I haven't done enough. What have you done? I'm going to read you these two letters and I'm going to let you get out of here. Who knows who hard work is? Raise your hand. What's hard work? Okay, here's my question. What has hard work done for you? This is a basketball player in this school that's pretty good. What's his name? Derek, I think? I knew his name. I just act like I did. 
Eric Davis, I didn't want y'all to think I was a group. I know who he is. <laughs> if he wrote a letter to hard work, I wonder what it would say. If you guys wrote a letter to hard work, what would your letter say? You look a little quizzical, a little confused. My question is, what has hard work done for you? What has hard work done for you? Has hard work done anything for you? Because hard work has done a lot for me. Let me read this letter. It's titled, Dear Hard Work. Dear Hard Work, I used to hate you. When you called my name, I used to hide from you, hard work. I made excuses in my life because I didn't acknowledge the truth. Hard work, I was afraid to fail, so at times I didn't even try. I didn't even try because I was afraid. I was afraid of your name because of what you had done for others. I watched you make successful people cry and the lazy people quit. I resented your name and everything you stood for because I was too scared and too afraid to challenge myself. I hated you during basketball practice, so I made excuses and I blamed the coach. You followed me to baseball too. You made me quit. Hard work. I decided to drop out of school because of you. That's what hard work did for somebody. Nothing. And when you don't work hard, you still think you should get a D1 scholarship. Is my son going D1? No, you ain't going D1. Why ain't my son going D1? I want him to go to Michigan. Because you don't do nothing to go to Michigan. You don't do Michigan grades. You walk around here with your pants sagging, with probably fake trues on. <laughs> Yeah, now you now, now you listen. Now you know I know what I'm talking about. And you walk around here, and yet you and your parents think that University of Michigan is gonna come pick you up. They're not coming to pick you up. You have nothing to offer them. Because hard work has done nothing for you. Listen to this other letter. Dear hard work, I have watched you shape the lives of every successful person I know. You have helped the poor become rich, the hopeless become hopeful. You helped transform my grades hard work from F to A's, and you caused me to ne have a never give up attitude. You made me realize hard work, that failure is not an option. When people laugh at my dreams, you always help me prove them wrong, hard work. <laughs> when I didn't make the team my freshman year, and everybody laughed, hard work. You're the reason I earned that scholarship and I graduated from college. When my electricity was shut off and we didn't have enough food to eat, the thought of you got me through tough times. A wife, a career, four kids and two master's degrees later, I want to thank you, hard work, for everything you've done for me. So, very simple, and I'm going to stop. If you wrote hard work a letter, what could you put in your letter? Dear hard work, my name is Misha Giles. I go to Saginaw, Arthur Hill, and I want to thank you. Hopefully it ain't no Misha Giles in here. And I want to thank you, hard work. Hard work, you showed me the true meaning of greatness by keeping me away from parties. I keep me away from all the boys that was lying to me. You don't like me, boo. <laughs> Hard work, you are the reason why I am college ready. Hard work, you are the reason why I have an 18 on my English portion of the ACT, a 22 in math. It's because of you, hard work. You made me want to quit at times, and you and I didn't agree. But ultimately, you helped shape my life. Thank you, hard work. So I want you guys, if you remember anything I said today, remember this. If you have to write a letter to hard work, what would be in your letter? Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.